I appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're at. Um, just as a quick reminder um, to follow along with the ASHA CE discussion that Sherry just had, um, ASHA CEs are going to be available for speech language pathologists. For those of you um, who are not speech language pathologists, because we have a lot of folks on the line here today, um, you can request a, a certificate of, uh, of attendance um, if you're viewing this from the live webinar. So again, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Adam Scheller. Today is September 7th. Uh, just uh, to let you all know, I am in Florida, so we're starting to get ready for all this, uh, this storm heading our way, and uh, we're hoping that it, it, it sort of skirts out to the East Coast a little bit further. Um, but I'm glad everybody could join us before all the mayhem starts. Um, we're going to be talking for this next hour about dyslexia screening. I'm going to talk about screening in general and really, um, really address um, some considerations that we have to have when we're looking at screeners in general. You know, there are some implications of which ones you choose, um, not making one better than the other, but there's a process by which you can really account for some of the weaknesses in screening in general. And it's important that we remember and understand what screeners are used for. So we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that first. Uh, then we are going to look at the Shaywitz dyslexia screen. That's the meat of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to show it. I'm going to show you some examples of it, and uh, at the end, I'm going to talk about some, some of the sample reliability and validity data that we have. Then the question is going to naturally really move into where you put a screener in place, whether or not it's universal or tier two, and whether or not the Shaywitz or others um, can be applied at any of those, those levels. It's really important that that be our, our sort of culminating discussion, because uh, in reality, a lot of us in school systems um, have um, have that, that, that decision to make. Where do we put this into place? And it really goes off, off of the, uh, you know, the impetus uh, for, that was placed on us or that we have, uh, that we have to follow these guidelines that were now being placed by much of the, the, the nation's new dyslexia laws. So let's have that con discussion as we go along. Um, I'm, I'm welcome, uh, wel welcoming uh, Tina Eichstadt, who is the Senior Product Manager for Speech Language uh, um, um, products here at Pearson. She's also a speech language pathologist. So she is on the line and going to be answering questions in the chat box. Uh, the chat box is in the bottom left hand side of your screen. Um, please feel free to tap, type any questions you have in there and she'll answer them or I can answer them as we go along. Um, you also should have received an email late last night. I sent it out late last night which had, it was a second reminder email um, that has uh, uh, that has the handouts for today's session. So if you want the handouts, they were sent to you uh, to, the, uh, to the email address on file. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to get a sense of who's all uh, in the room with us. Um, if you don't mind filling this out for me, your professional role is most close, closely related to which area here? I'll give you a minute to fill that out. Okay, and as I, would have, uh, as I would have expected, a lot of speech language pathologists in the room, um, we have, uh, you know, as, as we're offering this for ASHA CEs, I would have expected that. So I'm, I'm glad uh, we also have some other folks in the room as well. We'll have this joint discussion uh, moving along. And I think it's really important that we have a discussion about dyslexia, include all of, including all of our professional roles, because it is, uh, it's very important that we, we distribute um, understanding and distribute the analysis of this um, very, uh, you know, much more common disorder than we in initially thought. So um, welcome to everybody. Oh, we have an occupational therapist in the room. Welcome, Amy. <laughs> All right, next question. Um, I want you to really think about at your location, in your school, in your organization. Um, please select all that apply. Who is most, uh, most typically part of the team that addresses reading? Um, so, so when you have a reading team, when you have a team that really looks at um, analyzing students reading e either at the school level or even at the individual level, who's, who's mostly involved at your location? Oh, wow, okay, so we have a good split here, good breakdown. Um, uh, and I think the educational di diagnostician category really is dependent on where you are in the country. A lot of uh, states uh, don't uh, don't have an educational diagnosticians, and others um, use use uh, use that profession quite frequently. Great, thank you for putting that information in the chat box. This information uh, gives me some good uh, background to really start uh, our our discussion today. 
And I'm not going to go into too much about what is dyslexia. That's not what the main point of our discussion is here today. But what I want to do is just by start out, start out by showing you this information here, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, when we think about dyslexia, really the two main um, categories for definition um, that we follow uh, were put out in 2002 by uh, the International Dyslexia Association, and then more recently in 2015 uh, by the U.S. Senate, the Cassidy Mikulski Resolution. And essentially, it, uh, you know, it, it outlines the way that we need to think about. This is a merged definition that I have here, up here on the screen, but it's a way that we can understand and guide uh, our services and, and the necessities that we have in our school systems. The first point there is super important, and is that it, you know, dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin, and we know that that neurobiology is quite clear. Um, we have much research that has been done recently um, on the locations and uh, brain regions that are most highly affected. But the other important point to really think about with that is uh, with neurobiological, uh, with learning disabilities that have a specific neurobiological origin, we can start to link other conditions to that. So we, we tend to see a high comorbidity or co-occurrence of other disorders like dyscalculia, which is a disorder of uh, mathematics. And we, we tend to see a high, uh, a high incidence uh, where, where folks are having uh, really demonstrating uh, issues re regarding both of those. So it's important for us to think about that. But really, we're looking at a disorder that's characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition, uh, poor spelling, decoding abilities. They really oftentimes result from a deficit in the phonological component of language. So it's important that we don't lose that language piece. We will, we're going to keep coming back to that. That's super important for us to remember. And it is also very important that we recognize that it is uh, oftentimes unexpected in relationship to other cognitive abilities. So when, um, when, we, when we look at the whole picture of a person, um, we may see reading difficulties in a lot of students, um, but it is important that we differentiate out dyslexia specifically um, for kids that have um, uh, you know, these reading difficulties in, in an unexpected profile or an unexpected pattern. Oftentimes we see um, strengths in other areas. Um, so we see strengths in areas that are unrelated to the processes of reading or language. And, um, and that's where we can really make that differentiation uh, more pronounced. But I really want to bring us back to this slide.